Please respect the process and our speakers and avoid recording and taking screen photos. If you'd like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A feature on the Zoom. You have access to this. For all events sponsored and co-sponsored by the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, we begin with acknowledging the land that we are on. Here to speak to this important moment is my colleague at the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, Sabrina Sawyer. Thank you, Alice. And thank you for asking me to bring the land acknowledgement this evening for this event. Anin Sego Sewagwego, Sabrina Sawyer and Dishnakaz, and Nishnabe Kwe and Dao, Manjikining First Nation, Rama and Donjaba, Branford and Donjaba, Wabajeski and Dodum. Good evening. My name is Sabrina Sawyer, and I work in equity and women's services with the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. I am speaking to you tonight from the Haldeman Tract here in southwestern Ontario, which also falls within the Dish with One Spoon territory. A land acknowledgement is much more than just a statement at the beginning of an event. It should reflect the intention of the group or persons doing the work. I have shared that many of us are sharing the Dish with One Spoon territory this evening, and I find it fitting that we reflect upon that wampum and with respect to the work that's happening here tonight. The Dish, the dish with One Spoon is a wampum belt about sharing. Different peoples coming together and sharing the resources of the land, sharing with one spoon. And they shared with one spoon to avoid violence or injury by a knife. It was very intentional. And that original agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe was very intentional in that way, which I think was intentional of this work that's being shared tonight as well. And I think that's important to keep in mind. It was intentional to be peaceful. They did establish some rules to share the resource and the land. Firstly, to take only what you need. Second, to ensure that there is some for the next person and to keep the dish clean. I would like this to speak to, I think this could speak to the call to action 63 that creates intercultural understanding and as we come to share this resource, we keep these thoughts in mind with those we are learning with and from, and to only take what we need at this time. Don't overwhelm yourself thinking you need to be an expert, to make sure you share with the person next to you and to do no harm, otherwise keeping the dish clean. We all have a responsibility to this agreement who live in this territory but we also have a responsibility to one another to take care of one another. Similar to tonight, ETFO and the Toronto District School Board came together and they shared in the work and tonight they're extending it to all of us. With the Anishinaabe culture, we would have come together and performed a smudge at the opening of an event. And we do that so that we can cleanse our minds so that we think in a good way. We would cleanse our ears so we hear things in a good way. We would cleanse our mouth so that we speak and our words would come out in a good way. And we would cleanse our full selves so that we would walk in a good way. And I think that contributes to the work that has happened to, to bring this resource to life. And I'm truly honored to be a part of this evening. And I wish for everyone to move forward this evening in a good way and enjoy the sharing of this resource with your neighbors and your colleagues beginning tomorrow. So thank you for inviting me, Alice, and I wish you well in your evening. Thank you so much, Sister Sabrina. Uh, you've begun our event together in a powerful and important way. Much appreciated. So in addition to the land acknowledgement, we also uh, read our Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario Human Rights Statement. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario is committed to providing an environment for members that is free from harassment and discrimination at all provincial or local federation sponsored activities. Fostering the goodwill and trust necessary to protect the rights of all individuals within the organization. 
neither tolerating nor condoning behavior that undermines the dignity or self-esteem of individuals or the integrity of relationships, and promoting mutual respect, understanding, and cooperation as the basis of interaction among all members. Harassment and discrimination on the basis of a prohibited ground are violations of the Ontario Human Rights Code and are illegal. The elementary teachers of Ontario will not tolerate any form of harassment or discrimination as defined by the Ontario Human Rights Code at provincial or local federation sponsored activities. So in listening to Sabrina speak, I'd like to identify my own location to this land. My family and I came to Canada as immigrants from the Philippines. Growing up as a settler, I did not learn about Indigenous people's histories and lived experience until I was an adult. I also became, uh, I also came to understand the struggles and histories of Indigenous peoples in the Philippines. So for me, fighting for Indigenous rights means a deeper dig into my past home and current home. Events and initiatives like this one has personal as well as political importance for many of us as social justice educators and activists. I'd also like to take a, mo a moment here to acknowledge an Asian age educator and community member who just recently passed away. Valerie Ma died on Sunday, February the 7th on her 83rd birthday. Principal Ma, as she was lovingly known, lived her life for the betterment of others. A committed and passionate educator, she was the Toronto District School Board's first female Asian um, vice principal. And she taught at Withrow Avenue Junior Public School and Bruce Public School until her retirement about 20 years ago. It is appropriate to pay tribute to her today at this event. So um, as we move along the, the program, if you'd like to tweet out or share on social media, these are the three handles and tags that you can use. Hashtag ETFO anti-Asian racism or at ETFO educators or at TDSB. So tonight's webinar launch uh, launches a resource entitled Addressing Anti-Asian Racism, a resource for educators. This timing is appropriate in that during the second week of Black History Month, it emphasizes the need for solidarity work in the anti-racist movement. As well, we acknowledge Lunar New Year on February the 12th for Korean, Chinese, and Vietnamese communities. This is a significant moment in bringing together two educational organizations, the Toronto District School Board and the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. The collaboration offered us an opportunity to raise awareness about a timely and critical social justice issue and to bring to light the need to address racial violence for all of all kinds in schools, communities, and, and society. The development of addressing anti-Asian racism began this last summer in the earlier months of this current pandemic. Eight writers of diverse Asian backgrounds and social identities came together. What is a commonality for them all is their commitment to anti-oppressive education. Their names are Emily Chan, Stephanie Chung, Stella Kim, Melvin Lo, Kian Lu, Sangeeta McCauley, Jason To and Mary Tran. Throughout the document, they weave their experiences of discrimination and share stories of resilience and community strength. Highlights of this resource are that it provides learnings of historical and current realities of anti-Asian racism. It centers black liberation and indigenous voices as a necessary positioning in addressing anti-Asian racism and the fight against white supremacy and colonialism. And it offers key strategies and tools to disrupt racism in schools and communities beyond representation and towards affecting structural and systemic change. During this webinar, you will hear speakers address these issues as well as direct us to challenge lateral violence 
anti-Black racism within Asian communities, and the necessity to examine one's internalized racism and privilege. We will be directed to participate in active allyship and solidarity amongst and within racial communities for an authentic and liberatory anti-racist movement. So this resource is now available on both the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario and the Toronto District School Board websites. Before we close today's session, I will direct you to the links to access and download the document. So at this point, before I introduce our first guest to bring greetings, I would like to acknowledge Karen Marie. She brings her regrets for us uh, with us to not, uh, she brings her regrets for not being able to pre present with us and participate today. Karen is the centrally assigned principal for the Center of Excellence for Black Students Achievement at the Toronto District School Board. She is one of the leads and brainchild of this resource and initiative, and one of the key people to bring the two organizations together in this collaboration. She brings her well wishes from the Toronto District School Board. And at this point, I'd like to invite Jacqueline Spence, System Superintendent of Equity, Anti-Oppression and Early Years to bring greetings, greetings from the Toronto District School Board. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much, Alice. Good evening, everyone. I'm very proud to be here to present this timely and important document. It was truly a response to student voice within our system, imploring us as adults to respond to the rise in anti-Asian racism as a result of COVID-19. It is also the result of a collaboration between the Toronto District School Board and the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. This resource was written by educators of Asian descent whose daily lived experiences, personal and professional knowledge, as well as their passion for social justice, make this an invaluable resource to help build the capacity of all educators throughout the province of Ontario. We thank everyone on the writing team for all their hard work. And we know that this is the first step towards building the capacity for all educators to intervene and act in a timely manner whenever anti-Asian racism occurs. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to invite Curtis Innes to the mic, Associate Director Interim at the Toronto District School Board to also bring greetings. Curtis. Thank you very much, Alice, and good evening, everyone. It uh, gives me great pleasure to bring greetings on behalf of the Interim Director of Education, Karen Faulkner, the entire senior team, the many trustees who I know would love to be here, many who are in a meeting at this very moment. In this month of February, TDSB celebrates Chinese Heritage Month, African Heritage Month, and of course, Lunar New Year celebrated by many communities. It gives me great pleasure to join you in support of addressing anti-Asian Asian racism in schools and communities. We commit to you as a board to always engage and keep this work in sharp focus in dismantling racism and oppression in all its ugly forms. We enter this work collectively and collaboratively in the spirit of Umoja or unity, in total support of each other and affirming each other's humanity to dismantle all forms of oppression and racism, including anti-Asian racism. I'm proud of the work of many of our staff who have contributed time, energy and intellect to the resource written by TDSB staff in collaboration with our union partners in addressing this. This work could not be more timely given the rise of anti-Asian racism, which has been exposed by the emergence of COVID-19. We need to be even more vigilant in our efforts to eradicating the scourge of anti-Asian racism in our society. This particular form of racism has caused great harm to members from across peoples of Asian heritage going back centuries in this country. This makes the importance of this work for students, 
staff, and community even more relevant. This work in addressing anti-Asian racism has not been given the attention it truly deserves if we're going to make a difference. Thank you for helping to shine a light on this harm. Working together, collectively, collaboratively, we can make a difference to eradicate the scourge on our society. May you have a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Curtis. Um, at this point, I'd like to uh, invite Sam Hammond, president of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario to the mic to bring greetings and to say a few words. Uh, thanks, Alice, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. What a pleasure it is for me to be here representing ETFO uh, on this webinar. I wanna thank everyone for joining us as we launch this timely and important resource in response to increasing displays of racism during this COVID-19 pandemic. And thank you for your commitment to social justice and to addressing and eliminating anti-Asian racism and all forms of racism and discrimination. You know, this global pandemic has given rise to violence and overt forms of discrimination that continue to impact Ontario's racialized and marginalized communities. And, it, and it's clear that anti-Asian violence has increased since, since the COVID-19 outbreak in 2020. And we've heard from educators, students in the community about their experiences confronting anti-Asian racism and its impact on mental health, well-being, and safety. And let me be clear, and I know that you will agree, there's no place in our society for this kind of hate and discrimination. This innovative project demonstrates the strength of working together to develop a significant tool that supports the professional learning of educators as they offer high quality learning in public schools across this province. And on behalf of the Elementary Teachers Feder Federation of Ontario, we thank the Toronto District School Board and the writing team for their partnership on this. Anti-Asian discrimination resurfacing today has deep historical colonial roots in this country. And this is an urgent time to ensure that we end this troubled history of racism. And at the same time, we must recognize that to enrich students' knowledge and understanding of Canadian history, we must go beyond the curriculum to also affirm and value Black and Indigenous people's lives. I know this evening's event and this resource will provide foundations for reflection, discussion, and social justice action. And I'd like to offer ETFO sincere appreciation for the contributions of the writing team, tonight's speakers and panelists, the organizers, and to our community partners. And I wanna thank Karen for her initially getting us together on this project. Thank you again for your participation and I'm looking forward to the session. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Jennifer Watt. I'm the Program Coordinator of Teachers Learning and Leading in the Toronto District School Board. And it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce to you both of our keynote speakers, Jen Ling Chang and Vidya Shah, both of whom have rich stories to share with us based on their expertise and experience in creating spaces of dialogue that aim to deepen our understanding of anti-Asian racism in historical and current contexts and how to combat white supremacy and colonialism in our communities. Our first keynote speaker, Jenling Chang, a social activist educator, is the former associate director of the Toronto District School Board. Currently, she is the executive director of Alpha Education, fostering their commitment to social justice, humanity, and global peace. And she is also an executive member of Asian Canadian Educators Network. Jen Ling believes in the power of education and narratives of lived experiences 
that together make our uncommon histories into a common history of Canada. She considers the questions, who are at the table? Who tells the stories and why? And if some are not at the table, how are they represented? As central to advancing a positive and constructive present and future. Our second keynote speaker is Dr. Vidya Shah, an educator, scholar and activist committed to equity and racial justice in the service of liberatory education. She's an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at York University, and her research explores anti-racist and decolonizing approaches to leadership in schools, communities, and school districts. Dr. Shaw is committed to reimagining emancipatory possibilities for schooling. And we begin with Jenling Cheng. Thank you, Jennifer. I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you, Jennifer, for your kind uh, comments. I want to start by thanking Toronto DC School Board, the Elementary Teacher Federation Organization for this humbling privilege to address a wide range of participants committed to social justice and anti-racism and anti-racist education. Thank you to all who are attending. First, I would like to say the opinions expressed during this presentation do not, that will be my first slide, I think. Uh, the opinions expressed during this presentation do not necessarily represent that of Alpha Education or the Asian Canadian Education Network. However, I'm very proud to be affiliated to both organizations. As we conduct anti-Asian racism, we need to keep in mind in what ways are we perpetuating anti-indigeneity and anti-blackness. This is a critical question as we fight for anti-racism and fight as we stand against anti-racism together. To start our conversation, I'd like to acknowledge that I came from a country that was colonized and a colony of the British Empire. And I do know the scars of colonization and the harm that it can do. We acknowledge the resistance and the survival against systems of oppression and exploitation that have been persistent, perpetual, relentless, that indigenous peoples, black Canadians, the African diaspora have experienced. It is with them that we center the conversation about anti-Asian racism. Racism as a social conduct, construct has complex histories. Common understanding is to locate the driving force of racism in attitudes and behaviors of biased individuals. This tendency, according to Salter, ignores, dismisses, and even denies systemic racism. However, cultural historians, social scientists, and activists are taking a more complex view of racist agendas and practices. Racism is global, it's not just local, it doesn't just happen in Canada. It is intergenerational, it's historical, and it's deep structure. Deconstructing, the next one, uh, I'd, uh, term I'd like to address is the word Asian, given that this is about anti-Asian racism. I like to deconstruct Asian as a term that refer to billions of people who have distinct civilizations, histories, culture, religions, ways of being and learning and more. Using geographic regions to describe Asians are less than perfect as it ignores the intersectionality of gender expression and identification, sexual orientation, class, faith, ability, and very important, the diaspora. In certain contexts, Asians are used as social contracts, constructs tied to politics or an Eurocentric assignment where the single narrative 
erases this multiplicity and hybrid identities. Asian experiences are not monolithic and therefore they're national, global, international, as well as inter, inter, intergenerational. I turn to the term othering. Othering is a process that marginalizes non-dominant groups by those with civic and social power. It stigmatizes, it positions other, those non-dominant groups as deviant and even dehumanizes, creating false assumptions and fabricated images. So with this assumption stated, uh, let me start by let's looking at some key dates in the history of Canada that illustrate the politics of race and, and power, asking the question, who can be citizens? Uh, Alice, thank you for the next slide. In the book, The Forbidden Citizen, uh, the next slide. In the book, The Forbidden Citizen by Ma Martin Gold provides a history of the legislation of exclusion act in USA, illustrates the painful 60 to 120 years of legislated racism experienced by the people who identify themselves as Chinese. Prior to Exclusion Act, there were the Japanese and Korean Exclusion League, which in BC is the Asiatic Exclusion League. These represent the intergener intergenerational racism experienced by those who identify as Asians. As this slide shows, a couple of dates have been identified to show as we travel through the 19th century into the 20th, into the 21st century to trace some stories of racism. Prior to these dates, in 1857, Gradual Civilization Act was passed that applied to the indigenous people. Shortly, the 1876 Act, the Indian Act, introduced the residential school. It was, it took to the year 2008 for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to be established. And in 2015, it ended with 94 calls for action. This tells us the passage of time that the indigenous people have to bear the brunt of racism, of colonization. In 1885, the Chinese hate tax was passed. This is the only population group that they pay a tax for the race they belong to. It took 121 years for the federal government when Steve Harper apologized in 2006. In 1914, Kamagatu Maru, an incident that brought 300 over South Asian to the shores of Canada as part of British citizens and they were turned away. It took 120 years for Justin Trudeau in 2016 to apologize. In 1939, the ship MS and Lewis brought 900 Jews in search of refuge in Canada and they were turned away under the term, none is already too many. It took 79 years for our government to apologize in 2018. In 1941 or 1942, the War Measures Act was passed and that War Measures Act interned Canadians of Japanese descent and they were dispossessed and displaced and it took 43 years in 1988 for Brian Maroney to pass to apologize. And if you look at the date 2019, Bill 21 tells us in spite of those stories, there's still a legislated racism that arise in the year 2019. Bill 21 is a bill that prohibits religious symbols for any public service workers. The impact of legislated demonstrate racism demonstrates that constitutional and legislation changes result from a host of provocations. 
changes did not often come from those in power, but by those oppressed, as the story of Force 136, the unwanted soldiers, as the next slide show, or the story of the Asahi baseball team of Japanese Canadians, or the story of Gurdit Singh, who were imprisoned on arrival, being sent back on the Kamagatu Maru, then a, to India, which was then a colony of the British Empire. These historical narratives shape as much the present and the future as their stories of history, where history meets humanity and those who seek justice and redress. These are as much stories of survival, of mobilization against the politics of race and power. The movement from fringe to mainstream racist ideologies are often enabled and amplified by the media. As slide 15 shows, the political cartoons propagated in the 19th and 20th century. These cartoons are generated from the othering process and ideology. Take the Chinese immigrant in the next slide, the experience, the shut out image, or the Vancouver Daily Province depiction of Chinese New Year, or to that of the comparison of the Chinese condition versus a white family with a caption, they can live on 40 cents a day, showing Asians as opium addicts and eating rats. When the CPR, Chinese were paid with $1 a day compared to $2.50 for European labors. And there this caption that says, they can live on 40 cents a day. You can imagine the hurt and the harm when these were published in media such as the Vancouver Daily Weekly. Historically, inflection points occur when the specter of racial discrimination against a specific racial group raises its ugly head. And this happened in 2003 with SARS and regrettably in 2019 when the world faced a pandemic. In addition to COVID-19, there was increasingly reinvigorated unapologetic racist political rhetoric that reflects blatant vulgar form of racism that is usually associated in the past as you saw in these political cartoons. But as the next slide illustrate, images and cartoons representation also reflect concepts of othering. They were institutionalized to the construction of racialized groups. And I will take two examples, the model minority and the yellow peril. They as used, are used to establish racial hierarchies of adjacent power. The caricature, black as intimidating and to be feared, the indigenous as a savage, and the Asiatics to be ridiculed or a collective threat, colonized condition where they seek separation rather than solidarity are captured in the model minority and the yellow peril. These concepts create divisions between races, between ethnic groups within race, and between members in an ethnic group and the self. The model minority is used as an enabling racial hierarchy, an example to counter rights movement. Those Asians are seen as spectators, something invisible, succeeding in spite of colonized condition. The yellow peril, on the other hand, be, depicts unposh, to be loathed, to be dehumanized into an animal. Too many, too Asian. And what are the impact? It reduces Asian feelings to racialized feelings and racialized status. It creates identity issues. It creates self-hate. It creates in Asians gaslighting and the feeling of being dismissed and being relegated to the forever foreigner 
and conditional belonging. Pandemic do not produce hate, but racism produces hate. The data on the next slide shows that within eight months of the outbreak of COVID-19, 600 plus overt incidents of hate were registered. 83% of that were East Asians, 7% Southeast Asians, 2% South Asians, 1.5% biracial, and 1% indigenous. In conclusion, I hope these narratives have shown that racism that we experience, anti-Asian racism among all other racism is not local, it's not provincial, it's not national, it's global, as well as it's intergenerational because those are legislated. They come about because of systems of oppression and systems of exploitation. I want to conclude by quoting Ibram Kendi. To be an anti-racist is a conscious radical choice in the face of history, requiring radical reorientation of our consciousness. We need to develop conscious, inclusive intentionality and develop memberships through uncommon histories, voices unheard, stories overlooked. As Martin Luther King Jr. called, membership into the beloved community when humanizing instead of demonizing and through a circle of concern and solidarity where we begin to redistribute power and privilege so that we all can breathe instead of I cannot breathe. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Jen Ling. And we would invite participants to ask questions in the Q&A, which we will, we will come to after our second speaker. So, we would now like to invite Dr. Shaw to address our community. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to ETFO and TDSB for this partnership, for the work, for the expertise, um, and for the commitment to really thinking through and combating dismantling racism in all its forms. Uh, to the tremendous writing team, uh, thank you so much for putting your words and thoughts and experiences out there. And to the coordinating team, Karen Murray, Alice Tay, Jennifer Watt, thank you for your direction here. I'm so excited to be in conversation with Jen Ling Chang uh, and later with Amy Go uh, about these experiences. And you know, I, I want to begin um, by just naming that this is, as Alice was saying, Black History Month. And I think about Black histories, Black herstories, Black their stories, and Black futures and futurities. And I want to be clear that today's webinar is about dismantling white supremacy and settler colonialism, as I'll, I'll speak to later, um, and that our experiences of racism are deeply interconnected, while different, deeply interconnected, and that our liberation is deeply interconnected. And so I wanna start with that. And I also would like to start by, um, like Alice did earlier, positioning myself in this conversation to challenge the desire of white supremacy to flatten the Asian experience. And in my case, the South Asian experience. My ancestral lineages of colonization and resistance are a coalescence of migration stories from India to different parts of the world. So my mother's uh, great grandparents were coerced into indentured servitude in Trinidad and Tobago. And my paternal grandparents migrated from India to Zanzibar, Tanzania for economic opportunity. My parents settled in Toronto in Dish with One Spoon territory. And like other immigrants, uh, were not aware that Canada, this sort of land of promise and opportunity, was founded on and continues to perpetuate cultural genocide, land theft, and murder of Indigenous peoples. I identify as a colonized settler. And I continue to negotiate my own histories of colonization and my present responsibilities to preserve the waters and lands upon which I live and work as a treaty person 
and to continue to fight against the ongoing theft of Indigenous land and life. I also identify as cisgender, straight, able-bodied, English-speaking, a university professor of Hindu and Jain religious affiliations, both multicaste and, multi, and, and, and multi-ethnic. And I share these identities as important filters, both visible and invisible, that inform my talk today and, and challenge this notion, as Jenling was saying earlier, that there is one essentialized way of understanding the Asian experience. Alice, can I just ask you to change slides? Thank you. So it's important uh, to ensure um, that as white supremacy would have us do, that we're not making invisible the numerous intersections, histories, contexts, complexities, and tensions, both within and between Asian communities. I think about, for example, the farmer strike that's happening right now in India and the hundreds of thousands of Sikh farmers that are striking for workers' rights and the challenges between um, religion uh, and the tensions between religion uh, that are happening there right now and nationalism as well. And as Jen Ling shared earlier, uh, Asians, East Asians, South Asians, Southeast Asians have and continue to experience multiple racisms. Uh, we are often invisible, as she was saying, in the media and textbooks and in institutions. And if you think about it, this, this mass array of billions of people around the world, the global majority, are reduced and essentialized to POCs. And we have to really think about what that does, what that limiting and grouping does to our understandings of race, racialization, and racism. We are also often invisible in conversations about disrupting white supremacy that often position racism as the black-white binary. And it's difficult growing up in North America, as I did, where we are often caught in between multiple complex worlds and we face racisms in the form of language, ethnicity and accent discrimination, xenophobia and more that are often not named as examples of racism in the mainstream conversations. And how do we make sense of this? You know, Jen Ling shared uh, examples of the ways in which Asians are racialized and racialization happens in part because of racial capitalism. This idea that uh, it's, it's a process of deriving social and economic value from our racial identity, um, fr from the racial identity of another person. And it's important to note that our social and economic value as racial groups changes in response to the needs of white society, in response to the needs of the nation state, and in response to the needs of the, of the global labor market, creating changing racial hierarchies of human value and worth. So while one minute we are the model minority, the next minute we are the perpetual foreigner. And we saw this happen with the rise of East Asian racism in Ontario and globally connected to COVID-19. Next slide, please. And so despite the multiple and intersecting experiences of Asian racism, and despite the complexities within and between Asian communities, we also have to ask ourselves how our positioning in a racial hierarchy in the middle of a black white binary might actually contribute to settler colonialism and anti-black racism while maintaining us as the perpetual foreigner. How do we hold in our bodies, in our minds, the idea that we might simultaneously harm and, and, and be harmed, that we are both affected and complicit, that we may be both colonized and colonizer? Now, this is the difficult work and the beautiful opportunity before us in working towards racial justice. And in part, this means that we need to understand histories of our racialization in Canada. And I want to really thank Jen, uh, Jen Ling for that beautiful history lesson around the various ways in which anti-Asian racism has been embedded structurally in Canada's history and present. Now, the model minority myth in particular was an intentional creation to support white supremacy and white racial capitalism. The Canadian Immigration Act of 1967 assigned points to immigrants based on criteria like language fluency, English, um, um, uh, sorry, language fluency, education, and job skills. And so while tens of thousands of Asians came to Canada as political refugees, many came on the point system. 
These such policies birthed the myth of the model minority. And so despite being previously seen as uncivilized, sinister, heathen, filthy, the model minority myth emerged as a political identity in Canada and the United States in the 60s and 70s during the rise of the civil rights movement to construct Asians as the answer to racial and economic challenges, as the model race, as the deserving other, thereby justifying the ongoing racism towards black and indigenous people. Asians were forced to assimilate through conformity, passivity, and non-resistance in order to be protected from racial discrimination. As author and editor Aisha Tabassum states, we owe, we owe Black Canadians our right to exist in Canada as people of color. And yet, anti-Asian, uh, and anti, uh, sorry, anti-Indigenous racism and anti-Black racism are prominent in Asian communities. It shows up in our unwillingness to learn about the histories of these lands, the cultural genocide, the residential schooling, the enslavement of Black people in segregated schools, and the ways in which these racism continue, these racisms continue today in every institution through the ongoing theft of Indigenous land and life and the justification of state-sanctioned violence against Black and Indigenous people. It shows up in, our, in, in not knowing our responsibilities as treaty people on these lands. It shows up in choosing to live in quote unquote good neighborhoods, which is code for white neighborhoods, as opposed to black neighborhoods that are perceived as dangerous. It shows up through shadism, where we have the association of, of affluence or, or beauty with fair skin, leading to the billion dollar uh, bleaching product industry that we have. It exists when we reduce indigenous and black culture to food, music, dance, clothes. And when we gain financial and social benefits from the appropriation of these cultures, it occurs when Asians buy into white supremacist views that associate blackness with deviancy and criminality or associate an indigeneity with being uh, indigeneity with being uncivilized or of the past. It operates when we deny and erase the expertise, the realities and ways of knowing of black and indigenous colleagues, students, families and communities. We perpetuate anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism in our silences, in our apathy, when we turn away, in our denial, in our inactions, and in choosing not to speak out when we witness these racisms, especially by other Asians. So we also have to ask ourselves and think about the ways in which we have used our racialization to increase access to material wealth, social capital, and racial safety, often at the expense of others unknowingly or knowingly. As activist and author um, Deepa Iyer states, speaking specifically to South Asians, but this may be applied to other Asians, many South Asians take the racial bribe and climb the racial ladder in a futile attempt to reach the status of whiteness. Now this is in no way erasing the experiences of anti-Asian racism, but it's asking us to consider the ways in which we have used the particular racializations that, that, that we have been socialized into to our advantage. So for example, some Asians may embrace the use of the model minority stereotype, however damaging it is to gain access to white spaces, again, whether for economic gain, for social status, or for racial protection. Some Asians may play into stereotypes of being mystical or foreign or exotic and aspire to whiteness and maintain proximity to white people instead of naming and troubling these very gazes. Next slide, please, Alice. There we go. And so this is the question. How do we think about this? Where do we go from here? Next slide, please. White supremacy and colonialism want to make invisible all forms of racism, anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Black racism, and anti-Asian racism, and many other forms of racism. It is our work to make visible all forms of racism, to think about the tensions and, com and complicities between experiences and enactments of racism, and to not forget that the common goal of all of these projects is dismantling white supremacy and colonialism, exposing the ways in which Asian raci racism operates structurally and systematically both challenges the myth of the model minority and it challenges the desire that white supremacy has to use Asians as an example to suggest that racism doesn't exist. And so as Asians, by not naming the ways in which racism plays out, we are actually perpetuating anti-Black racism. Right? 
We can intentionally learn about racial hierarchies, racial capitalism, and the ways in which Asian communities have been used historically and presently to justify the ongoing violence and harm towards Black and Indigenous communities. Next slide, please. Learning about the racialization of Asians reconceptualizes the Black-white binary, from a binary to a racial continuum. And what that does is it increases the racial consciousness among Asians and increases the likelihood that we will form cross-racial solidarities or coalitions. So for example, it helps us to think about the ways in which the model minority continues to serve the white supremacist agenda of divide and conquer. This idea that as long as we are divided and working within our own silos, that we limit the capacity for coalition building and engaging in an uprise against white supremacy. In a white supremacist system, it's dangerous for racialized people to be in solidarity, to learn about our, our, our historical solidarities and to dare to forge future solidarities. As activist and author Valerie Kaur states, throughout history, there have been attempts to pit Asian and black communities against each other, a tactic that encourages us to turn on each other rather than tackle our common oppression, the system of white supremacy. The efforts, these efforts distract us from the very real solution of building cross-racial solidarity to root out racist oppression. Now, there comes a point when we recognize that our struggles are deeply interconnected, that addressing and disrupting racism towards Asian communities is necessary, but ineffective if we do not see it as part of a much larger project of dismantling white supremacy and colonialism. This work is not about erasing our experiences of racism. It is about recognizing that our experiences of racism are part of a much larger racial project designed to exploit and dehumanize us differently to maintain the financial, economic, and political power of white people, which is the system of white supremacy. Now, true solidarity requires that we deeply understand our own experiences with oppression. This form of solidarity allows us to act from a place of justice instead of guilt or shame that minimizes our experiences and focuses on how our stories of oppression and liberation are deeply intertwined and that we need each other in this fight against white supremacy. Final slide, please. In our institutions, our classrooms, our schools, our school boards, and our unions, Asians can unsettle colonialism and white supremacy and our willingness to name the ways in which racism impacts us and to speak up, take action, and refuse practices that deny the existence of settler colonialism and anti-Black racism. As people who have been racialized to model minorities, we can choose to, ple to play a gatekeeping role of white power or we can choose to expose and disrupt it. We can choose to withhold information, feed information to power, keep secrets, engage in backdoor deals, be protected while other people are being harmed or punished, feed into the myths of neutrality and meritocracy, be the token racialized person that's not really making any important systemic change and benefit from privileges such as nepotism, favors, access to information and job security, or, we can actively resist these aspects of whiteness that we may have benefited from on one level, but that have deeply dehumanized us at another level. This also means that on a personal level, we are having these conversations with our families and friends regularly, changing the collective racial consciousness of Asian communities. Much of our aligning to whiteness has been to gain acceptance, belonging, and safety in a system in which we are perpetual foreigners. But what if, what if we might work collectively and in solidarity to dismantle systems aimed to pit us against one another and instead seek a notion of belongingness that truly wants us all? Thank you. Thank you so much, Vidya. Thank you, Jen Ling. We, we do have some questions. Um, that we will ask both of you if you can uh, comment on. The first question is, how do we dismantle inter-Asian racism? Jen Lane, did you want to answer that first? Or do you want me to go? It's just on mute. Okay. Would you like to try, Vidya? <laughs> yes. Sure. 
You know, I think one of the things that I, I often think about um, with regards to this question is that in the same way that we need to build solidarities across races, we need to build solidarities within the various ways that Asian is taken up. And a lot of that requires us to do our own deep dive into the ways in which we have internalized racism, the ways in which we have been harmed by racism and to not push those away or deny those experiences, but to really delve into them. Because when we can delve into them and make sense of them and understand how they are situated within a larger context of anti-Asian racism and white supremacy, it allows us to, to recognize that this is not, there's not something wrong with us. It takes the shame away and helps us understand that this is part of a, a much bigger project of, of divide and conquer. And when we can move into that space, the likelihood that we are going to be able to really form those solidarities, that we are really gonna be able to understand the ways in which our experiences are similar and different and to really respect those differences, um, it, it, it puts us in a very different place to be able to have those conversations because we're not coming from a place of unacknowledged harm. We're coming from a place of consciousness and critical consciousness that's necessary to have these kinds of conversations and to recognize at times that, you know, we are racialized differently within Asian. You know, I think about in the South Asian, in, in the South Asian community, for example, there are so many complexities and tensions there, right? We have casteism, we have nationalism in different ways. There is, you know, issues of shadism, it, all kinds of things that operate um, that are leftover legacies of colonialism and ongoing legacies of white supremacy. And so not choosing not to essentialize ourselves, I think is really important. Looking at the multiplicities that exist in our identities and learning about our histories and how colonization and white supremacy have informed us and have, have constructed us socially are really important. Uh, I would like to add to what Vidya said. I think, am I on my mute? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question. It's just uh, actually a very, very important question that hits at many of us, the identity crisis, the division within the race, the division within ethnic groups within the race and so on. How do we do that? I talked about the single story, which is a social construct. And I tend to think it's a white supremacy or if not, it's a colonial. Colonialism is alive and well in 2021. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, racism is a system of oppression and exploitation. So let's bring it down. When the single story is amplified over and over again through social media and media, you begin to believe. And that is why Ibram Kendi he says it's a very hard consciousness we have to develop. If the same story is repeated again, say about a Sri Lankan group, and I read it over and over again, I have to consciously fight it to say, this is not true. This is a fabrication. And I think that is what all of us are fighting because mm -hmm. the fabricated, the manufactured caricatures mm -hmm. almost as if it's the truth. So we have to discern that and begin to reach out to each other as on the individual level. I think when we begin to know all of each of us as people, uh, I think we can then begin. The other thing I share with uh, uh, video is any social justice. I have to be involved. It's not just my social justice, social justice that impacts my community, whether it's the social justice against the indigenous people, the black diaspora, the South Asians, I have to be able to walk in my shoe. I remember Dr. Avis Gray saying, until you're able to walk in that person's shoes, and feel the harm, they feel harm when racism hits them and embrace that as your own, you can't do that. Like Lisa Delpit, teaching other people's children, you teach other people's children as your own children. That is the beginning of the consciousness that I think uh, we are talking about. And that brings this start to dismantle racism. So I hope that is one way of looking at it. Thank you. And we have, Time for one more question. Um, 
how can Asian educators and allies challenge white supremacy in the education system while dominance swims in structural power and yet still survive? Then do you want to take this first? Yeah, when we talk about white supremacy, I believe we are talking about, I keep going back that racism is systemic, is structural. Uh, it is in, sometimes in our curriculum. Actually, I did a test. I ran the word Asian down our equity, our provincial equity uh, curriculum. It doesn't appear. The very absence that Vidya talks about the invisibility already is a structural racism. Uh, we can talk about employment, promotion, hiring. We can talk about public health. We can talk about access to financials, banking. All those have built in powers of, uh, of and barriers, depending on which racial group they are, talk, they are looking at. So if you are talking about education, I would like to approach by saying that as teachers, curriculum is in our hands. It's a policy about what we teach but it doesn't tell us how we teach it. And there in the how, you can begin to dismantle racism that could exist in our classrooms or could exist on the boardroom to our classroom. It's not just in our classroom, I would say from the boardroom to the classroom, the entire spectrum of the education system. And if every one of us begin to look at our curriculum in that light and how to make it consciously inclusive mm -hmm. and how to challenge what I call the most dangerous in our curriculum is what I call fragmentation and isolation. What Dr. Henry Wu says, you tell, you learn the history say, he says the history of Canada, you have settlers, Turtle Island belong to the indigenous people. You have settlers crossing the Atlantic Ocean and settlers crossing the Pacific Ocean. Yet settlers coming from the Atlantic Ocean has civic and social power over the settlers coming across the Pacific Ocean. Let's change that narrative. Let's take the history apart and deconstruct it. We have to teach the land of Canada, the Upper and Lower Canada Rebellion, where other rebellions are happening. We have that power as teachers. And when we do that, we begin to dismantle a policy that could be very Eurocentric, but need not be. And when we begin to do that, and I believe sincerely in the power of education, you have more and more students and more and more teachers working in unison, irrespective whether we are white, we are brown, or we are black, or we are yellow. We are all working to dismantle that curriculum. You're going to have what I say, this wonderful book called 400 Souls that was launched on the eve of uh, Black History Month, written by Keisha Blaine, traced the history of the Black American from 19, 1619 to 2019. And they took five years, chunks, and they call it a community history. If we begin to approach our curriculum as community history, uncommon histories to be made common, whether it's mathematics, I'm not talking about history lessons only, we are have coming, we're gonna bring a sea change, I believe. Uh, and this book is inspirational to me because when I attended the webinar launched by the Smithsonian on the Museum of African American History, 7,200 people attended. And this book encapsulates 80 writers and 10 poets. And they describe it as a choir, as an orchestra, the singing the stories. And many of the writers are ordinary people they intentionally selected. Some are thinkers, some are iconic leaders in the community. And among the 80, there are 10 poets. And the poets that wrote are like soloists, they describe it. And I would like to recommend on a, a poem and they call it, And the Record Repeats by Cheetah Lai Sabre. It is like talking about the playbook of colonialism and white supremacy we talk about, and yet we are able to dismantle. In education, is through the curriculum. And I'll stop there, let Lydia jump in. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I completely agree. I think the curriculum is such an important place for us to dismantle and disrupt uh, individually and collectively, which is why I think the work of, of, of TDSB and EPFO in particular, that put together fantastic resources uh, like this resource is so important to helping shift that. I, I wanna pick up on the last part of that question um, that says, and yet still survive. So how do, we, how do we challenge this and yet still survive? And I think that's such a, an important part of that statement because it does feel like survival at times. And it does feel like if we speak up as individuals, if we challenge something as individuals, that we are risking our own protection. And it, in many cases we are. And I think about this in a couple ways. On the one hand, I think about the fact that that sort of suffering, especially for Asians, is part of the invisibility cloak that we are in. So not only are our histories and our realities invisibilized, the ways in which we suffer around racism are invisibilized. And it's something that needs to be, that we need to be talking about more, which is why events like this are so important. And I think the other thing is that we need to see this collectively. We need to think about how we de-individualize these conversations, how we collectivize around these issues so that it's not simply one person speaking out for themselves, uh, hoping that they can you know, um, make some change when they know that they're going to be harmed in, in some sort of way by sort of structures that be. How do we do this as a collective? And I think the importance of unions here are so strong. And the last thing I'll say is that this work is not easy and we do have to take risks. It is about risking. And oftentimes when we don't take risk, it means that somebody else is being harmed as a result. And so that relational way of thinking about how we do this work is so important that if we take a risk and we put ourselves out there, we are making it better for somebody else. And if we choose to stay silent and we choose to, to not put ourselves out there and, 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 and question and disrupt and, and uh, offer different uh, stories and solutions and narratives that have been hidden and subjugated, if we don't do that, then somebody else is being harmed, if not ourselves, right? And so um, it's, it's, it's tough work, it's important work, it's necessary work, but it's liberatory work. It's work that, that helps us feel more human, more alive, more connected to each other. Thank you so much, Vidya. Thank you, Jen Ling, for your powerful words, for those humanizing words, um, words that give us hope, and now I'm going to go over to Alice to introduce another guest. So our final guest this evening is Amy Go. She is the president of the Chinese Canadian National Council for Social Justice. As a social worker by training, Amy devoted her professional career to serving racialized communities immigrants and seniors in community and long-term care. For over 30 years, she's been active in social and racial justice movement through many national, provincial and local adv advocacy organizations. Currently, Amy is working as a consultant through Peachtree Canada Wellness Incorporated, providing services to nonprofit organizations. Please welcome Amy to the mic. Thank you so much. Thank you, definitely. It is a privilege and an honor to be part of this um, significant event um, in our education system. Um, Chinese Canadian communities have been really longing for resources like this together with other Asian Canadians and other racialized communities so that our children can have the opportunities to learn about racism, to learn about our collective responsibility. Chinese Canadian National Council for Social Justice educates, engages, and advocates for equ equity and justice for all. And in the last year, we have been very active in speaking of against uh, the rising anti-Asian uh, attacks against Chinese and other Asian Canadians during the pandemic. So we have an opportunity to speak to many community members, including Cantonese and Mandarin speaking community members who are relatively new to this country and to hear from them. And we learned that there is so much fear and anxiety, not only for their own safety, but for their own senior parents and their young children. So, you know, comments like, we migrated to Canada so that our children can have a better life. And I just hope that they don't have to migrate again. 
and um, comments like this truly break our hearts and really rally, you know, and, and, and strengthen our conviction to do more. And so we've been um, working on a number of projects, including one where we are working on resources for children and households to engage in anti-racism um, discussions. And these is, of course, um, the, the, these uh, tools are targeting Chinese Canadian children and households, and it will be framed within the, uh, you know, the speaker said, the hierarchy of racism and, and, and the structural, you know, inequities that we are all subjected to. And so through this project, we also have opportunity to speak to children in Vancouver, in Toronto, to get their feedback. And we realized that, in fact, Chinese Canadian children, these are children from grades three to about grade five, they don't really have had a large chance to talk about racism. And, um, and even if they have encountered micro, microaggressions themselves, they don't see them, that's, and that's racism. And, and then when they encounter comments like, where are you from, or comments about their, their language, they dismiss them, they think they are jokes. And so, you know, some people may argue that, you know, this is for preservation. This is, you know, so, so the children, they know that they, in order as, you know, as we said, that it is hurtful, it is harmful to encounter racism. And, you know, in order to preserve yourself, you, you know, that you don't speak up. And when nobody, and when the structure and the system is not there for you to have this discussion, the more you can imagine the impact on the children. And in fact, just today, I had an opportunity to speak up to a professional Chinese Canadian who grew up in Canada. And we were talking about the perpetual foreigner myth, you know, and the label and this, you know, this, this, uh, this perpetual foreigner imposed, the label imposed on Chinese and other Asians as we've heard from our speakers the impact of that and the link to this, you know, this file and racist attacks that these you foreigners, you brought in the virus to Canada, you were the ones who are responsible for whatever that's happening, even in China, you know, that the virus being, you know, produced in the lab in China, and it's for you, it, and the, that you are to be held accountable. That's why, you know, you are to be blamed. So this perpetual forms that we are never considered Canadians is really one of the roots and this um, reflection of the systemic racism and the reflection colonization and the inequities that we are all subjected to. And you know, the speak, this uh, young professional Chinese Canadian woman said, she has always felt there was something wrong, but she could not name it that she, this is the first time she had an opportunity to talk about this perpetual being considered a foreigner forever in her home country, in her hometown. So, you know, I mean, it is so important for, uh, for this kind of resources that we are all, you know, hearing from, from the TDSB and uh, ETFO. And so Chinese Canadian uh, 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 National Council for Social Justice will continue to embark in other initiatives. And we have done online spread of uh, Stop the Spread of Racism, which is a campaign to raise awareness. We have resources on our website called Face Race, uh, campaign, which also hosts a lot of resources talking about the historical and present context of anti-Asian racism and community resilience and how we fight against racism. We also partner with organization in the community to allow people to, and to, to sort of encourage people to report um, racist attacks that they have encountered. And, and lastly, we will be launching these online, uh, these online tools and resources to engage the households and children to talk about anti-racism. And so once again, I want to thank the organizers for this great initiative, but I also urge if there are any participants who are dialing in and joining us from around the country, 
to take these resources, not only, you know, to apply them not only in Ontario, but outside, you know, to across the country. As we've heard in Vancouver, the anti-hate hate crimes have increased by over two, uh, sorry, 800% from 2019 to 2020. So you can imagine these tools and resources are not only of great benefit in Ontario, but across the country. As the speakers have said, we are, in the, we are all in this together and we urge all of you, all of you to share everything and devote all your energy to combat racism for everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity again. So thank you, Amy, for everything you and the Chinese Canadian National Council are engaged in the work to fight against racism. You addressed the necessity for community partnership and action. So thank you. So we're near the end of our uh, program. And before we do that, I just wanna make some thank yous. So there are many thank yous to make. On behalf of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario and the Toronto District School Board, thank you to all the speakers, um, and guests today for sharing your knowledge, experience, commitment, and time to the work of anti-racism and anti-oppression. Disrupting white supremacy, colonialism, and racism involves deep critical understanding that moves us all into action and strengthening our alliances and solidarity. I want to also thank all of you participants who have come from many different geographical spaces. We have representation from all areas within and surrounding Ontario, as far west as British Columbia, as far east as New Brunswick, as well as attendees from south of the border, specifically New York and Washington. And there are even one, and two, one or two friends from Hong Kong and Japan signed up. So thank you for all the time, uh, thank you all for taking the time to attend this launch and engaging in the learning with us. And as a final point, you can access the 90 page resource at the following website on the screen, accessible and downloadable. The recording of this webinar will also be posted in the websites in the next few days. So once again, thank you, take good care and goodbye. <laughs>